What is up, YouTubers? So for today's video, we're going to be tackling weld defects and how it affects the strength of the finished weld or what you're making. And this is kind of in response to a lot of questions I got over the past couple of years. And it's something I really haven't touched too much on as far as like actually destructively testing them. But I figured now's a great time. So I welded up a bunch of terrible welds. And we're going to look at all these up close and I'll explain kind of more of what's going on. So that's a general idea of what we're going to tackle today. Let's get into it. So here is the lineup. <laughs> all pretty terrible welds once you get past this guy all the way over. Now, I welded all of these with hardwire MIG with 035 wire. All of these were run with 100% identical set points, which I'll be honest, I don't remember what the set points are. They were probably for more or less quarter inch plate. This is 3 8 plate. And so they're a little bit undersized for a single pass. The penetration probably won't be the greatest. It will still be acceptable uh, for what we're doing in this testing. Now this guy over here is just basically a average typical MIG weld. A little bit of spatter. Some of that may have came from other ones that I welded. But it's just an average weld. It doesn't have a blown out corner too much. The start's decent. I mean, really, beyond that, it's just average. It's not great. It's not terrible. When we come over to this guy, clearly uh, something went very, very wrong. And what went wrong is I shut off the gas and then welded this. So this is about as, mo the, as much porosity as you could really expect to have in a MIG weld. Uh, due to lack of shielding. Now the interesting thing is is that there probably will be some fusion, uh, maybe not root fusion, but there's going to be some fusion in here. But we're going to directly compare this with that other one that's far better and really look at what the strength difference is. Now this guy right here, this one is Again, no gas shielding at all. It's a little bit better than that one over there, but honestly, not by much. I mean, when you look at this, purely trash, and I don't expect those to do that well. These two, on face value, maybe they look like a multi-pass weld you might do. They're a little bit rough, a lot of spatter, and that is directly because the roots of these, so it's, both of these are three-pass welds, look identical to this. So all I did is no shielding gas welded the root. All I did is wire wheeled or uh, excuse me, hand brushed the root, welded two beads over it and called it good. Now I can tell you when you weld over trash like this, uh, I was having a very hard time controlling the puddle uh, with MIG, which is something that generally isn't an issue. Uh, excessive spatter, it was just very difficult. Now this one, ran better than this guy but it's still terrible and excessive spatter you get the point and you can see the amount of buckshot bb's down here from lacking uh the total lack of shielding gas at the start so again all terrible welds now what we're going to be doing today is going to be really fun and we're gonna we're just about to get into it so get your popcorn and your ginger beer ready i am going to bend this away from the face along with this guy away from the face so we can compare and contrast the actual strength of these two to show you how important it is to have at least a decent initial pass. This guy right here, we're going to chuck in the shot press and basically bend it away from the face in order to see how much we're going to lose in strength. Now, short arc MIG generally will pass in that test. This I don't think will, just judging by how poor it looks. These two, I'm going to bend one towards the face and one away, and we're going to see how much having a poor root really will affect something. And this should bring that out. Now, I don't really know what's going to happen. I'll be honest with this. As we bend this away from the face, it might fail. It might hold together because... The top cap passes are far better than the root. And when you bend something like this, the stress is going to go here and the root is less of a concern. But I still think we might see failure with this. But we won't know unless we test it. 
So with that said, let's uh, get to breaking the ones towards the face. All right, so I have it all set up. This is going to be the clean weld first, then we're going to break a dirty weld, and then we're going to break a multi-pass weld to get a better feel for what's going on. Now, I've done a bunch of these brake tests with MIG and stick and etc. Short arc MIG on 3 8 plate on this particular test generally is around 70 to 80 foot pounds in that ballpark. This may be a little bit less, and that's simply because the set points I was running were probably a, a little bit on the cold side, not by much, but a little bit for 3 8 plate. It still should perform decent. Now, if you don't know, this particular test is more of a test of how good the penetration is and not tensile strength. And that's kind of been a confusion where I get a lot of questions on, well, this is unfair, blah, 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 test. Well, it's not unfair. You're not going to see very high numbers with this test versus actually bending it away from the face. And the simple reason is, is that the weld itself can be used as leverage by the plate. And I've covered that in previous videos, but I'll just say really quickly, all that really matters is, is that you have some root fusion and preferably some penetration past the root. If you don't have that, what ends up happening is when this plate bends, without the bottom of the plate tied down to the bottom plate here, so the top plate and the bottom plate are tied in in that root section, this plate can simply use a weld as a lever and it doesn't take much to break it. And that's what I think we're going to see today when we break this uh, poor porosity filled weld is that my guess is there's very minimal strength, partially because the root is going to be trash, but also because the weld itself is trash. So with that said, let's break this and see how close to average we are with this. All right. And it's going to read and hold the maximum. And actually, this one was not bad. Uh, of course, it cleared itself. It was over 100, so that would be very good uh, results for this test. Now, remember, you have this whole thing from here to here adding on to the foot pounds that I'm reading here. So we actually have a pretty decent amount of force on this. But 100 is really good on this test. To put it in perspective, and I don't know, honestly, what we're going to get here, but an average brake strength... Uh, probably for the poorest I've ever seen, might be like 60 foot pounds. So if this is under that, which I would assume it's going to be, that would mean it's basically the poorest result I've ever gotten this test for a single pass weld. Well, let's break it. And 72. Now the interesting thing is that's not the weakest result I've ever had but it felt like I was breaking a potato chip and you probably heard it. It just went crack and that was it. So very, very poor feeling. And in this case, I would definitely say if this saw like any kind of shock loading or impact force, it would break very quickly. 72 uh, foot pounds on this actually is, I would say on the verge of the lowest average but again, it, uh, it's not good. Well, let's go over here and we're going to test that final plate, which has multiple welds on it. And this is kind of a great idea or great thought I had. Well, with multiple passes, how weak is it if you have poor root fusion? So my guess is the performance of this is not going to be that much greater than this guy, simply because in this test, uh, the root fusion is what matters more than anything. But we'll find out. Let's see. Oh, actually was pretty good, surprisingly. 187 foot-pounds, so quite a bit better than I would have suspected. Of course, I didn't do a three-pass weld on this plate with uh, hardwire MIG. Realistically, I know it's going to be stronger than this guy. By how much? Hard to say. With this done, I'm going to break these off, put them on the table. We'll come back and talk about the results when we look at the 
results up close. Let's go over to the shop press and break the other ones. So to start things off, we have this pretty terrible single pass MIG weld done with no shielding gas. We already know that that <laughs> bend towards the face failed miserably at about 40% less strength by having no root fusion and porosity. So that's a pretty huge difference. So that's not good. But the question is, will this hold up underneath the pressure of this press? And I think we can make an educated guess and we all know that this is gonna fail. Now to give you an idea, if you haven't seen one of my videos where I've tested this, under normal circumstances with a MIG weld on this, you can bend this and this will bend all the way down just like this guy here, which is a stick weld, and it won't fail. I have a, about zero confidence that this will make it that far, but we can get some hard numbers, and I'll give you a comparison to what I've tested before as far as like pressure for failure. So all I'm gonna do is chuck this in here just like that. <clears throat> I have a feeling this is going to just catastrophically fail without warning pretty soon. And there it failed. Quite interesting. All right, we'll put this on the bench and let's test the last one. So now this guy is a two pass done over a shitty root, very bad root. Uh, again, no shielding gas on the root. This is the better of the two. I purposely picked this one just because if we want a fighting chance of passing on this, this would be the one to do. I have a feeling this might actually fully bend and the reason it will is it's going to put the whole two top cap passes per se the two top welds under tension and try and pull it apart well those are likely fused into this plate and this plate decent so it's kind of like if you were to take a bar of steel and just brace it from like the bottom the top plate like this so it's going to kind of triangulate this a little bit. I have a feeling that the crap in the root is not going to affect this. If it does affect it, at some point under tension, it's just going to crack straight through both of these, which is not something you would expect to have happen with short arc MIG on this run with decent settings. It, it wouldn't normally crack. It should fully bend. So let's see what's going to happen here. If you keep an eye on the pressure gauge, you're probably going to see it stay around four tons once this thing is starting to bend. That's going to be pretty typical for this test. If you see a drop below four tons like you may have seen on this previous one that failed, uh, that's a good indication it's about to fail. And one of the scary things with this is much like in real life, say if this was a bridge or something structural that needed strength, it's better to have things fail casually than just catastrophically break. And that's what you're going to find, I think, with that poor root. If this is going to break, it's going to be under a tremendous amount of strain and then just catastrophically instantly fail with no warning. And that's something you don't want. You want notice, and you want flexibility, ductility, things of that nature. All right, let's get the bend in it.
This is taking quite a bit more force and the reason is, is that we're trying to bend it out further, but it should start settling down closer to four tons. Yeah, now it's more or less bending the plate instead of the welds. And I'm going to call it there because it's pretty much parallel. There's not a whole lot more I'm going to gain on that. Well, you know what? I'll give it a little bit more. Yeah, I don't know that. I don't think it's going to fail. All right, well, let's go and look at what we got. So these are the three face bend welds and the first one, which was a clean weld, did exceptional. So that's great. The other two, not so much. Although I was kind of impressed with this three pass weld, it held together better than I would have expected, but realistically nowhere near what uh, proper clean welds with a three pass would have likely endured. So let's talk about this guy, the first one, the clean weld. So when you take a look at this guy, it has a lot of good signs and some not the best, but it's a clean weld. So first off, we can see the color is very consistent. We don't see a bunch of big holes or porosity in it, so that's good. The weld penetration itself is actually not that good. Let me get this focused. We want to see more or less not a straight line, and when you see here, some parts of the original plate edge are still there. Like a little bit here and there, it bit in there. Here it actually bit in far more, and then of course the corner where it was plenty hot bit in. But, you know, I would say this is about 30, 20 to 30 percent of the penetration you would want to see. And even with that said, it did still perform pretty good in this test, even without the root fusion. And lack of root fusion is really what kills uh, bend tests in this direction because remember this was bent this way. That lack of fusion, like I said early, earlier, basically uses the weld and once it busts the plate a little bit, there you can see that better, it just, it's once it breaks this edge, it loses most of its strength. With that said, it did exceptionally well, and I would like to see more root fusion, but with short arc MIG and C25 gas, you're simply not going to get it. So this, acceptable, but not definitely not code legal for a liability job. Now this guy is exactly what you would expect to find if you had no shielding gas and were trying to short arc MIG. This is about, honestly, the worst case scenario you could ever expect with short arc MIG. Simply a shit ton of porosity, and not just any shit ton, a metric shit ton for you guys over the pond. This is definitely undesirable. Very difficult to fix stuff like this. And people had asked me in the comments in the past, like, what do you do if you have something like this? Well, the correct answer, the book answer is, to take and grind this out by any means necessary, be it, you know, a grinder, a die, uh, die grinder, a burr bit, uh, arc gouging, carbon arc gouging, anything. Get all this removed and re-weld it. That is something that people don't do often, you know, well, people should do it, but sometimes they just weld right over the top and that was the purpose of the other tests. But when you look at this whole edge basically untouched. Now don't get me wrong, this doesn't win any penetration awards, but when you compare the differences, like there, you can probably see it 
at least in a couple places it bit in, this sucker is just 100% laser straight line, no fusion, which is to be expected. Now this failed in a much different feel, like this guy felt strong, 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 and it almost felt like it wasn't going to break, and then it finally broke, and it kind of just snapped, kind of like a wet twig that's green on a tree. This guy didn't feel like that. This felt like a dried out stick where you put the pressure on it and it might handle some load, but then all of a sudden it just snaps and that's it. So very poor performance. And one of the things you guys got to remember, and I probably don't talk about it enough, there's such a thing as a shock loading. If this part, say this was something you welded to hang some crap in your garage, right? So a static load on this that was, say, done like this, might take three, four hundred pounds to break it, okay, right at this point. The problem is, is that what happens if you take a hundred pound object and slam it down on this? Well, that, the inertia and the momentum of that weight hitting this can impart far more force than just some simple static load. And that's where you're going to see failure with crap like this. This better weld over here can take a lot more of a hit without failing than this will. And then this probably will not just absolutely catastrophically fail uh, versus this is going to give up with no warning, especially like in the other tests where I bent it this way. That's what becomes really dangerous. Now this guy was the three pass weld that I bent towards the face. And I got to be honest, it actually held on far longer than I would have thought, uh, almost hitting 200 foot pounds. When we look here, we still see massive problems. Now, the original weld is all down in here, but we still have new porosity that's up in our new weld deposit. You can see it right there. And then also, it might be a little bit hard to see, this area in our new weld that I welded over this, full of porosity. Inside of here, we can see again, Porosity up here and very little pieces in there and again very, very poor Now despite the fact that this took quite a lot of strength to actually break all of that clearly was from This and this weld The problem with this is well that can you weld over a poor root? Yeah, do you want to? Absolutely not now, had I welded both sides of this, the fact it had a crappy root in there probably wouldn't be the end of the world. But again, you guys got to understand that shock loading is so much different than a steady increase in pressure. And it's shock loading or vibration that's going to kill poor roots on stuff like this. Like, if this was rigidly mounted to concrete and this guy had something that vibrated, over time, it's going to end up cracking through all of this porosity and then once that's gone you now have a smaller weld deposit than you want or that you should have for thicker plate and then it's going to fail so again realistically how do you fix this well if you have that bad of a root you grind it the hell out and, and then re-weld it and if you don't you will lose strength now i wish i would have done an extra set with clean welds but based on what i saw here I bet the difference is still going to be the same. It's going to be probably 40% higher than the numbers on here. So it would have been 250 to 300 foot pounds. And my gauge, I don't even think goes that high. It goes to 250. So we would have been maxing it out to break this with clean welds. So again, there is a strength loss there. Now, let's go over and look at the bends away from the face. So this is an abnormal result. A typical MIG weld on this, a single pass, it would have bent by far further and it would not have cracked through the weld. And I can show you that in the results on the next one. But it's very typical. You will start seeing a line form up here and you can kind of see where it's starting to detach. That's your typical mode of failure or when you see a, a weld like this get stressed in this test it's going to tend to start cracking at the top toe line to see it break through the middle is telling us that this weld essentially is junk 
and that would not be an expected result. You rather have the weld rip off through the material and the material failed than the weld itself, which, well, of course this failed because it was full of, again, porosity. You can see how rough that is on the end there. Terrible. Now, I didn't go and break this any further than what it was because it pretty much couldn't hold much of a load, much of a bend and failed, but we can learn a lot from what we see here. So, Again, in this test, if your weld is being stressed and the face is being stretched apart like this, porosity is going to significantly reduce the strength. When this weld was under the highest load, the weld itself actually saw near the end before it broke. It actually was around 3.5 tons versus a typical 7018 will hold 4 plus tons the whole way out. So a significant reduction in actual strength. And again, like I've kind of been harping on you guys, this uh, under vibration or impact force or any of that is so much more likely to fail. And we don't want that. Now, when we look at this multi-pass weld, this is more typical of what you would expect to find on a single pass where you see how it's got that kind of start of a crack on a top toe line. It actually has a little bit down here as well. That is typical of what you would find because as this is trying to pry this apart, essentially it created a point here and a point here and it's now trying to flatten this and stretch the faces out. You're gonna see that. But as you can see, it did not break down through the middle, which is ideal. In this case, you know, we basically welded over a extremely poor route and it still held. Does that mean you should do that? Again, not to sound like a broken record, guys. Absolutely not. Because welds, you know, this is tension in this direction with the plate. Okay, and is trying to stretch this. Well, if you didn't have access to weld this back side, and this is, you know, just what it is. Say you welded something on a trailer or whatever, where you didn't have access to this, by having that poor root, if this ever flexes that way towards my thumb, guess what? This thing's going to break a lot easier than it should. And that's why it becomes so critical and so important to have a decent root in because, you know, welds are often aren't just stressed away from the face. So you got to keep that in mind. And this is a very good teachable moment, teachable moment, <laughs> For you guys that you can't judge a book by the cover. Is this a perfect weld? Hell no. I mean, looking at it, it's got buckshot and BBs over its spatter. And it's not the most consistent. I mean, this part right here looks better. But this isn't the greatest. Down here, it's not a lack of fusion. It looks like that on the camera. It's just the lighting. See if you look at that. But it's not a perfect weld. But... You wouldn't think that this would ever have as bad of a root in it as it does. And that's why, you know, we do in industry things like uh, x-rays and ultrasonic and all of those because surface evaluations can't tell you the whole story. I mean, if you saw this weld on a bumper on your car or a hitch, you'd be like, oh, man, that's solid. I ain't going nowhere. Yet look what's inside. So... X-ray would, you run an X-ray machine over this, the the guy would hand you back papers that it would take more than $100 to bribe him to let that one slide. And that's why it's so important for all of you. If you lay a bad weld, fix it. Take some pride in your work. Don't let crap out the door. It's not good for anyone. And when you need it most is when it's going to fail. You can trust me on that. Write that one down. All right, let's go to conclusion. Well, what did we learn today, guys? Well, I learned that bad welds equals poor strength, but let's be real, you guys already knew that and so did I. We learned, I guess, specifically, at least in this case, the difference. And in these two guys right here, we saw a 40% reduction in strength, and that's not really accounting for the bigger picture, which is seriously compromised uh, impact strength, seriously compromised vibration strength or resistance to vibration i should say and then not only that it involves i guess the unknown which when you have well defects you're adding an extra ingredient out of your spice cabinet and with an unknown outcome 
And if you think of it like that, where really well defects are undesirable, you don't want any ever, but sometimes if they happen well, it's not the end of the world and it's not going to hugely reduce the strength. And for us, most of us home gamers, we don't weld on anything with enough liability where they actually check stuff with an x-ray where you cut out and replace any weld that uh, doesn't pass x-ray. We don't do that kind of work at home. So the truth is, is that we need to monitor our defects. And just because the surface looks good, like look at that, it's not that bad, doesn't mean what's inside isn't trash. And that is why the, it is so important for all of you, at least every six months, eight months, do a couple test welds, break them and see what the inside looks. Do, do a cut and etch. That is important information. And I know so many of you guys want like a hard and fast rule of how many defects are acceptable and how much strength you lose. But the truth is all of that is completely subjective to your situation. I don't know what you're welding on, how much strength it needs. I don't know how thick a material you have, etc. If you're welding auto body, on, on shitty old material that's zinc coated or whatever, you know, that anti-rust stuff they put on, like you're going to get porosity. Is that a problem for a car panel? Well, I guess it could be if it's split on you due to stress, but realistically not a big deal. If you're welding a coat hanger for your garage, for your shop coat, who cares? Like a little bit of porosity, not a big deal. If you're welding a frame on a car or a truck, now you don't want that because of the shock loading, the vibration and the, uh, probability of a crack forming so again so much of what weld defects are acceptable and what the true strength you're losing by having them really depends on so many variables i can't even possibly cover all of them in this video and on that kind of thought as well i used all the same settings for welding all of these okay and part of the reason why i did that is to try and bring some kind of consistency to this but had you welded any colder than I did with even poorer, you know, defects, or even say your defects weren't as bad, but you were colder than I was, the performance goes clean out the window on this. So you would have been even less than 40%. You could have been 80% weaker than this simple weld. And that's where the true problem lies is that weld defects, even if you can't see them are a problem, but you really need to be able to put enough heat into something to get some sort of fusion and clean weld. And if you don't have that, honestly, you're better off just grinding it out and fixing it. And again, if it's some non-liability, easy, you know, code hook or something that doesn't matter, I guess who cares? But I personally take at least a little bit more pride in my work. And if I see visually a defect, I'll fix it. Because again, I don't go and x-ray my welds. I don't do dye penetrant testing and that to, to observe if what I see that I think is a crack is actually a crack. But I go by what it looks, as do most of you. And that's why it's so, like I said, not to sound like a broken record, so important to test things to find out where you're at because it'll tell you so much more than just, you know, this visual inspection. And speaking of visual inspection, it reminds me of what a welding instructor told me. He said that 90% of inspection on welds is visual. And I kind of disagreed with him a little bit on that because it's like, well, you know, you got dye penetrant, x-ray and all of that. But he actually wasn't wrong because literally weld inspection is all visual. Because it's not just, okay, you see the surface, that surface, just looking at it, that's visual. But doing a cutting etch, you're visually looking at what's inside of it. Uh, doing a brake test, you're visually seeing penetration. Like, it's all of your vi visual, what you're looking at and what you can determine is going on that's giving you information. Very little information is really gained from a shop press, a uh, pressure gauge and testing or any of that. That's really just for comparison's sake, but it's all visual. And if you don't open up your welds ever and look at what's going on, you don't have that visual knowledge to know if things are going well or not. And again, they can be very bad even when they look decent and they can even still perform better than expected when they look like complete trash. So there's that, but again, take the pride in your work, spend the time, rework it, because I'll tell you what, if you care about what you do, the last thing you're gonna wanna do 
is invite friends over and to your garage or whatever. Or somebody looks at something you made and they say, man, what idiot welded that? We've all heard it. We've probably all said it to somebody and we've all said it to ourselves. And the only way to fix that is to gain enough skill to where you don't make as many mistakes. And then when you do make mistakes, because we all do it, some people just lie about it. You go back and fix it, and then you can at least say, hey, I went and fixed that. Because making good welds is more about fixing screw-ups than it is being a perfect welder. So with that said, thanks for sticking around for the video. Until next time.